Well, if you don't lead, the world falls way behind. Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Neil Cavuto, and Fox on top of Iraq becoming another Vietnam. Well, it's too soon to say this much is not. From the moment Barack Obama drew a line in the sand in Syria and then erased it, bad guys the world over seem to have called our bluff, and they are running with it. Iraq imploding. Syria laughing. Vladimir Putin rejoicing. Oil prices soaring. Time to start connecting. And here to do that, Ben Stein, Charles Payne, Degan McDowell, Adam Lashinsky, Charlie Gasparino will be back next week. Charles Payne. Oh, what do you think? no, Charlie. That's Hunter. enough out of you, Ben. All right, go ahead. Okay. Uh, you know, look, I, I mean, I think almost anyone who's watched this Iraq thing uh, from beginning to end sort of knew it was going to implode. I mean, if you looked at the death tolls, you know, in, over the past year, if you looked at the violence, it, do, it doesn't get any more media coverage, but you can see this thing. I think the timeline strength, though, I don't think anyone thought it would become this sort of crazy this soon. And to your point, there's no, there's no bad character, no bad actor in the world that takes President Obama seriously. And if you don't take the president seriously, then you're going to go with grand ambitions, and we're seeing it around the world. Is this a leadership vacuum kind of thing? Again, what do you know? It's somewhat a leadership vacuum because you can you can talk about the situation in Iraq and what the U.S. could have done in the last year or so, but Nouri al-Maliki, the prime minister, is a questionable dance partner to put it mildly, didn't fi sign the status of forces agreement, basically jettisoned Sunni leadership in the military, which is why the military fell so quickly. So what uh, the prime minister in that country has been doing is um, a serious question. However, when the president came out on Friday and said, well, we've kind of known that this has been going on for 14 months, why didn't you do something in the last 14 months? It begs the question why it is in a crisis stage now. What have we been doing as a nation and what has the White House been doing in the last more than a year? You know, Ben Stein, as a business show, I always think of the CEOs who come in and, and take over companies that are in a great deal of duress. And they talk about turning them around and then some of the things they have to do to turn them around. And they don't follow up on the, on, on the, the things they said to turn it around. Well, it's not long before they're out and the company is even worse off. But I'm just wondering whether that's really what's at core here, uh, a president who didn't it's do what worse. he said he would do. It's far worse than that, uh, Neil. At this point, the cancer of um, terrorism has metastasized throughout the Near East and Middle East. It is a disaster. If the, one of the biggest oil producers in America is going to fall to some of the most vicious terrorists in the whole world, they're going to have unlimited funds at their disposal. Uh, they're probably going to soon take over in Afghanistan. There will be a belt of very well-heeled, extremely violent, extremely anti-American terrorists. There's no way of putting that genie back in the bottle. It is, I think, virtually criminal the way Mr. Obama has allowed this to happen on his watch. We should. Mr. Bush bears plenty of responsibility, too. But for this to be allowed to happen, and for Mr. Obama, even and now, as the terrorists are on the outskirts of Baghdad, to be saying his team is studying it. They're studying it. Ben, That's insane. I, ben, I think... Ben, you know, as you like to say, with all due respect, I think you should be extremely careful using words like virtual criminal, because virtually criminal, because you're doing a disservice to the president when you say that. I'll bring it back to Neil's metaphor well, I about a do CEO. A disservice to him. I'll make my point. The shareholders and the investors were extremely clear. The American people were extremely clear they wanted to be done with the war in Iraq. And President Obama ended our involvement in the war in Iraq. That was the reality on the ground, uh, on the ground in the United States. Now he's dealing with the reality on the ground there again. It is not pretty. It is not good. But I don't think it's so easy to criticize the CEO when he got a clear message from his shareholders. Well, but, the, but, but no, I think you're missing the, the, the CEO real analogy. Leader. The Here, real leader. Ahead, the real le with the greatest respect uh, to Adam, the real leader will do what's right, even if the right. voters are reluctant and are dragging their feet. He will do what is right, right. to protect America right. and to protect the. And, and by the way, the, 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 no this, the shareholders in this case, and Charles, maybe you can help me with this. We're, we're, you know, it's one thing to say we're tired of a war and all this, but we're not going to just completely abandon the situation and not leave even, as military authorities said, there a contingency force in place right. to deal with just this sort of thing to but improve the transition. Now, it's easy to second guess that, but what we don't have to second guess is the threats that the president has made in the past that he didn't follow up on. Whether you have forces in the region or not, when you don't follow up on a threat, it, it emboldens those 
who like to be threatening. Exactly. 100 percent right. And, you know, listen, Adam has a point about how complicated this is. No one disagrees with that. But I agree with Ben's point in the sense that not only did the president, you know, fumble this in a, in a major way, but he, he politicized it to say, hey, we're I'm the real elect me. I got us out of Iraq as if, OK, we left and we left it as, as a place that's, you know, it's not some sort of Potemkin village. That it's not going to collapse. Five minutes after we were gone, and as it turns out, it's collapsing even faster well, than that. Well, that goes to my point, is that the White House and the president didn't address the threat as it was developing more than a year ago because it, w it, it was better politically and it looked better in front of TV cameras to act like al-Qaeda's right. on the run, everything is fine. And so now when, you know, what's hitting the fan in Iraq, now what are you going to do? It looks like you were doing nothing. Well, now what we to have to case. deal with, at Bed's time, maybe you can help me with this, is a lot higher oil prices. There's a lot of instability, a lot of concerns that the worst guys in the world are going to be in charge with the, the, the juice that keeps the world running, and it gets worse. Uh, I'm just wondering the financial fallout from this. What do you think? Well, it's going to be serious, although we, we are now producing so much energy in the U.S. that that mitigates the problem so much, somewhat. But so the wait a minute, I'm sorry. You think this is a short-lived development, that the, the run-up in prices? No, 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 I do not. Okay. I do not. But I think the fact that there's so much more oil coming on stream from the U.S. and from North America is going to help. But I think the real crisis, Neil, is that we have some of the worst actors in the history of mankind in a pivotal state in a pivotal part of the world, and Mr. Obama is studying it. He says his team is working all day long, 24 hours a day studying it. It's not time for studying. It's time for drastic action. And, and, and if it's too late even for that, then I think if, we have to really only, think to ourselves, is it going to be Fortress America again and isolationism if, again? I, I just want to say, if only it were that easy. We took drastic action in, in the Bush administration. It didn't work out the way anybody wanted it to. It just isn't easy. And by the way, I just want to say, Neil, I think you're right about Syria. The president deserves a black eye for his statement on Syria. That's different from saying that he behaved criminally. Well, to Ben's point, we also, in, as a nation, are in a I position... I think I said virtually criminally, and I think it was criminally, <laughs> but I'm going. But to Ben's point <laughs> about you. oil production, we're in a position as a nation where we can can be certainly tougher because we have so much production and because we have so much production in this country that uh, we are not as independent. We're w one year away from maybe being the world's top oil producer, so we can get tougher because we won't have a supply disruption. Charles, I mean, the bottom line here is it's our leadership that's at stake here and the way we're viewed in the world. This is the same week that we heard from Lech well, that's the course of the former solidarity leader in Poland that America's lost its leadership. Uh, Mitt Romney telling me this week, um, he talks to a lot of global leaders who just say, well, you ain't all that. So I, I wonder, too, in terms of the prestige, that has real palpable effect. It, it really, really does. And, and it's, I think a lot of people here feel that way. Listen, all the poll numbers for the president at the all-time low. Around the world, people are saying, America, you ain't what it used to be. Uh, people don't know that we can come to the defense. You look a little bit forward, Japan's going to have to change their constitution. Uh, they're not going to believe that we're going to come to their aid with China aggressively But flip that around. Over. Maybe that's a good thing. If we've always been That's the last resort thinking. to save their bacon, and we're not there to do that, yeah. they've got to look after themselves. I wouldn't mind. I think it was because by last uh, time I checked, we're broke. I would listen. Japan, fine. You know what? <laughs> uh, but I think we left a bunch of a bunch of. We left Iraq. We knew they weren't prepared. Uh, everybody knew Saddam Hussein broke those people down in a way that's you can't even imagine. He snatched their will. He snatched their power to live. I mean, look at these soldiers this week. They took off their uniforms. Two or three buttons, went, bu bullets went whizzing over their heads, and thousands of soldiers took off their uniforms and ran away. We made a giant mistake there, and I think it was because of politics, and that's why it's so but depressing. Charles, we also couldn't, but we couldn't stay forever, mm. Charles. We we just couldn't stay for indefinitely. Well, the bottom line well, we is, we could have stayed a lot long. Okay. We could have stayed a lot longer. And Charles, with the greatest respect, and I worship your intelligence, uh, the uh, Iraqis are pretty damn brave and resolute in fighting us. If they had been no, you know who fought us, Ben? A lot of those people fought us. us who fought us were insurgents. If you study the Iraq war, they weren't the Iraqi people. I have friends who over there who, as private contractors in the military, think about it. They, most of those people were insurgents from different countries, and, and the Iraqi people themselves have been broken in half. And you saw some of the training video, videos. They weren't ready. Well, I, I do. Well, I think the Iraqis are pretty brave people by and large, but, but the terrorists are simply overwhelming them, and there's no stopping point. There's no stopping point.
Well, to that point, you can hear somebody like KT McFarland say, if these two groups of people want to kill each other, then we should step out of the way and let them kill each other. Well, that might be what's happening. Um, but there are actually more than two groups now. I think they're like half a dozen. 